when I do something silly, if I do succeed, the gains will then be disproportionate. If you're dealing with the laws of physics, and Hayek made this point, it's kind of what economics has, has tried to do, and totally failed to do, I think, is to create the same kind of certainties around predictive models of human behavior that exist in the physical sciences. And you can do that, of course, because the laws of physics don't change. You know, what, you know what's true about gravity in three years' time is pretty much what was true 200 years ago. And so in building space shuttles and aircraft and so forth, that entirely rational numerical approach works. Now, the first problem you have with human behavior is there aren't metrics for most of the things we care about. You know, we don't have SI units for regret, irritation, injustice, etc. And so... This attempt, I think, by economists to create a kind of physics of human behavior was pretty much doomed from the very beginning. Um, but it's also true because, A, the future is, you know, uh, fashion, very simply, OK? You know, what is good today is not necessarily liked tomorrow. People's tastes change, people's preferences change, people's priorities change. And therefore, you have this fundamental problem that if, you, if you're always dealing with big data or past data, you're over-optimized on the past effectively. And I think, you know, that is, that's another serious problem about, uh, um, you know, all big data comes from the same place, the past, and therefore it's fundamentally unrepresentative of what possible futures could be. And in, in economy, we, we also assume, or in the past, it was assumed that human behavior is very rational and predictable, yeah. and that's not quite how humans are. And uh, would you like to? No, say? that's right. I mean, as yeah. I was saying, so th th that's the absolutely fascinating thing about any attempt to create a perfect model of human behavior. That, as I said about the the kind of girdling completeness a notion that you know we we are the sort of gap in any perfect system. In a sense, it's always going to be the unpredictable quality. But I was thinking as well, there's that also that idea that, and I I, I realise that that's that's the thing that subjectivity represents. But I was also I'm really interested in this question. I think it's the sort of Hamlet paradox when Rory was talking as well that that you have this idea of someone actually the tragedy that you often see in, in works of literature is that someone's trying their best to do what they believe to be the right thing, and everything works around them to shift the terms of the reality. And that's kind of also what's happening to us when we try to navigate shifting realities online and everything kind of changes, and we're not quite sure of the rules of the game that we're being induced to play. And you can see that with Hamlet, that he gets the message from the ghost, you know, I'm your dead dad go and kill your uncle. And he's constantly trying to reason with this actually really unreasonable set of circumstances, which is that he's in a revenge tragedy and he's got to just kill everyone. But he's trying to make rational decisions. And I think we really have that online, that there's a kind of strange digital paradox that's going on where something's happening that we don't quite understand a lot of the time. But we're being denied the ultimate rationality, we're sort of being a bit manoeuvred. And that brings in really interesting questions, I think, in terms of enlightenment notions of the rational, autonomous human who can make decisions based on knowing everything. In fact, at the moment, with this kind of misinformation, rising uncertainty of the real and unreal actors, I think you're getting a situation where, even if you're trying your utmost, like Hamlet, you can't quite gather all the information you need. There's a massive, strange process that's occluding certain things for various reasons. So I think that's something, it's kind of like we, we're we living in a novel without really wanting to live in a novel. It's that sort of odd thing. And so, you know, looking on to the future, how can we fix this situation? Um, you mentioned that animals don't need rationalism, rationality to survive. So we I mean, there are funny cases in the animal kingdom, actually, where uh, because of interaction between different animals, uh, it pays you to be irrational. Now, one, you know, one of them would be doing the unexpected thing. OK, if you, it is irrational for you to fight back if attacked by a superior force, but actually uh, it may be necessary, because otherwise, if you're completely rational in terms of uh, where you fight and where you flee... Uh, you'll just get taken advantage of. It's the unpredictable possibility that you may turn disproportionately nasty that keeps you safe, for example. There's a wonderful um, 
uh, anthropologist called Jesse Behrens who says, I'm a complete atheist, but when I get into a taxi in a foreign country, I always like to see a few religious icons hanging from the rearview mirror. He said, I, I don't believe them, the guy upstairs, but I like to know that my driver believes there's someone watching him. You see? Um, which you do. And there's, so there's an awful lot of games here. There's a fascinating thing about hares. Uh, which is when they're chased by a dog. You, if you've ever seen it, I'm sorry, I don't want anybody to think I go hair coursing, but if you've seen it on YouTube, okay, just to be clear, um, the hair will basically just leap around at random, su suddenly jump in the air, then it'll take a violent left. The hair actually has no control over this. The brain enters apparently a kind of random number generator. And the hair doesn't even know itself what it's going to be doing. And the reason for that is if the hair did know, it would give away telltale signs that it was about to turn left. Dogs would have evolved the facility to read these signs, and the hares wouldn't escape. So there are certain cases where actually behaving at random is actually rational, for example. And so that, that's, that all of this stuff arises. And the other one I was mentioning, sort of advertising and marketing, I always consider consumer capitalism as kind of, even if you don't like it, OK, it's the kind of Galapagos Islands of human behavior. OK, and the fact that, of course, one of the dangers of being rational is that you tend to end up in the same place as all your competitors. And the thing that I continually notice with really successful businesses is they contain an element of complete absurdity. So, you know, before Dyson brought out his vacuum cleaner, there was no rational argument for believing there was a market for an 800 pound vacuum cleaner. OK, I could have given you 15 reasons why it was daft. And I always say, you know, if you'd given a lot of rational people the job of coming up with a competitor Coca-Cola, they would have said, well, we need a really nice tasting drink that costs less than Coke and comes in a really big container. But the biggest success in competing with Coke is Red Bull, which costs a fortune, comes in a tiny can, and tastes disgusting. OK? <laughs> so so th there is, of course, it's worth noting that the, if life is to some extent a game of poker, there is this question of, do I do what's sensible, which everybody else does? Or actually, when I do something silly, if I do succeed, the gains will then be disproportionate. So, you know, and deciding between those two is, is not something I think you can make rationally, in a way. Mm. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying it sort of reminds me of uh, Thomas Kuhn's uh, conception of how science works, that it proceeds by um, revolution. Um, so, you know, the, the, there's this idea that sort of science is just, it's sort of completely guided by reason. But of course, you get these, uh, these, these occurrences in science where sort of everybody will be adhering to, you know, what, what Kuhn would call the, the paradigm. So the, a set of assumptions that yes. sort of grounds discoveries. And then over time, you'll sort of discover problems or sort of things that can't be explained. And then there'll be a revolution, which is kind of like, let's just reject all the foundational assumptions we were starting with and, and um, replace it with something else. So, you know, example might be the replacement of Newtonian mechanics with the quantum worldview. So the idea is that, I mean, that's not rational. That's because the sort of rational part of that is what, what's, you know, what he calls normal science when you're sort of working within the sort of non-revolutionary part, where you're just sort of deriving new discoveries from these sort of foundational assumptions, which takes you so far, but, you know, it doesn't describe the world perfectly. And then when you realize you, you kind of, you've, that there are things that you really can't explain anymore, then you have to kind of just chuck everything out and sort of get a new set of assumptions. And I think, you know, sort of what you're saying there reminds me of that, where you've got this sort of period of time, so, you know, sort of Coke is sort of, okay, based on what we know, yes. what is the next logical step? And then occasionally there'll be sort of something happening that comes out of left field. And, and that's, you know, that's not logic, that's the sort of creative, a new, yeah. a new idea that doesn't come from logic, but then that sort of demonstrates the limitations that we're working on. Or someone with, simply right? noted, I mean, an awful lot of discovery is not intentional, it's scientists noticing something. Mm, mm. Uh, penicillin being the most famous example. Mm. The microwave oven came out of a, um, uh, a scientist working on radiation, uh, some form of radiation, who noticed that the, the chocolate bar in his pocket kept melting. Okay. <laughs> and I always love the story from business, which is the Wall's Vionetta um, came about because there was a faulty conveyor belt in the factory, which caused what should have been a flat slab of ice cream to come out in the shape of scroll work. And again, it was an act of observation. Hey, that looks great, you know. And actually, I'm not sure you'd get there intentionally ever. You know, I, I'm not sure it's something, it's, I'm not sure it's a request stop. You know, it's, it's so much of this stuff is actually someone with the right mindset simply observing happy accidents or whatever it may be. 
And you, you can't really attribute those successes to reason, can you? It's so true. And the whole thing of serendipity, you know, again, if you, you know, if, if we all walk around now and we're kind of guided, you know, by our Google device and so on. But that, I was thinking of all the encounters everyone had through total serendipity. Do you remember? And you'd sort of yeah. go out and you'd just meet a series of people and you'd end up sort of, you know, married to one of them just by these random sort of sequences that would happen. So that thing as well. I was thinking as well as you were talking about science. Um, there's a short story by Borges called Exactitude in Science, and it's, it's this idea that the scientists of this great empire wanted to make these maps that corresponded completely to the reality, totally point to point in every element. And so in the end, they had to create these maps that were as big as the reality. They're enormous, you know, massive, <laughs> reality-sized pieces of paper. And of course, they couldn't work at all as maps. You know, you just got in the way and no one could live in their houses. And so they had to just abandon them. So that idea that if you push a rational idea to a really, really <laughs> extraordinary extreme, you end up with quite the opposite of what you wanted. And actually, on, you know, we all have predictive text as well. And I don't know what's going on with that because it predicts the most totally preposterous yes. thing. I mean, well, this isn't preposterous, actually, but the other day I was trying to type in fiction, and it, my phone predicted it as big ruin, which I thought, OK, that, what, is, what is the phone trying to tell me? But this sort of why has, you know, <laughs> why has anyone ever put that in? And the notion of who, what is the algorithm that predicts the most preposterous and unpredictable things that we're about to type? What's going on there? I also think there's a danger, which is when we obsess about what you might call the intentionality of progress, is we only measure in the positive column those things that our idea achieves that were intended beforehand. Because quite a, lot of, you know, quite a lot of interesting ideas have unintended consequences, which are sometimes very, very negative. But they're sometimes very, very positive. So, I mean, your example of serendipity in meeting, I always joke, when I had teenage daughters, what my daughters did not have, OK, was a party strategy, OK? Basically, all they knew was that when you go to parties, you increase your, this is sort of Nassim Taleb talk, you increase your surface area exposure to positive upside optionality. You see, OK? Now, you don't know, you don't, it's completely fallacious to go to a party with an intention of what the value you're going to derive is from that party. All you know is that if you never go to a party, you never get lucky, effectively, OK? And what that luck could be, you don't actually define in advance. You simply go, the, the, the reason it's worthwhile doing this thing is because shit might happen that I never anticipated that I subsequently come to value. And so that worries me about a lot of sort of business planning. I think there is scope for just saying, we're going to try two or three random things to see what the outcome is. Uh, and it's very difficult to do, because the finance people, it's much, much easier to quantify a cost than it is to quantify an opportunity cost. And so that very sort of accounts-driven, finance-driven approach to activity effectively just leads to cost-cutting as a default behaviour. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.